Hi, this is Terry Denry of the MathWorks. So, a couple weeks ago, I bought this processor. All right, so it's a board, really, a board from Texas Instruments. It's got a, a little C2000 uh, processor on it. And um, essentially, it runs C code, and it runs really pretty fast, and you can put pretty sizable stuff on it. Okay, the other thing I bought was this little board, all right, and so what this contains is a bunch of, I guess, MOSFETs, and essentially, uh, you know, this guy right here, the blue one, has got two ports, the, this guy here has three ports, all right, so basically means I can put DC power in here, and then I can put the voltages that I want on the three pins of an AC motor through the connections right here, all right. And the whole thing cost me, I think, about $75, all right, and so... What I think is really interesting is how the game's changed, right? That we have a processor in the loop, and in a way, it means we can kind of do whatever we want, all right? That, um, you know, we're not constrained by kind of the analog methods of electronics that I think people have needed to work with, let's say, over the last hundred years, right? And I'd say that the, the cost that we're operating at has really kind of changed the game, too. Right. So anyways, what we did last week, or at least in the, the previous video entitled Inverse Mechanics, was really quite cool in the context of this. Right? That we created a model that can predict the ideal torques that we need from our electric motors to achieve our motion trajectory for a complex system like the six degree of freedom robot. Okay. And um and so anyways, um what we're going to do in this video is introduce the concept of feed-forward control. Right? And we're going to use that calculation and we're going to use a little bit of feedback to just make sure that our robot model stays synchronized with the real robot that will be controlled based on this feed-forward method. So anyways, I think that this is exciting and um, I hope you like it. So let's begin where we left off in the inverse mechanics video. Right, and so basically we have the two robots. The yellow one being the inverse kinematics robot to calculate the ideal angles for the actuators to achieve the you know the motion that we're seeing right here, our motion objective. The multicolored one being the inverse dynamics, meaning that it's calculating the ideal torques to achieve the same motion. Okay, so getting back to our Simulink model, you know we see that the inverse kinematics feeds the inverse dynamics. You know, so those perfect angles feed each of those actuator axes and that enables us to calculate the required torque for each of those actuated axes. All right. And I want to remind you, if we jump into the inverse kinematics, you know, we'll recall that there is a robot um, whose motion is really being programmed through its attachment to this little gray plate that we have. And um, the robot is in a force torque configuration meaning that its inputs are going to be in units of newton meters so that those are torques All right and that our inverse dynamics is going to be in a motion configuration meaning that it's going to take angle as expressed in what i call pva position velocity and acceleration All right. Now our whole goal is to control something kind of real and a good precursor to doing that is well let's start testing this control algorithm against a plant model. All right? And so I'm going to just take another one of these robot models and I'm going to drag it over like this. I didn't do that very well. Let's do that again. All right? Hit my space bar. All right? And let's send those torques directly into it. Okay, and a couple things we need to do before we hit the run button. Uh, one is that we do need to connect it into what I'll call my world environment, which sim simply establishes, I'll call it an inertial reference frame. It also defines gravity for both this robot and this robot. So that's what we're doing right there. Okay, now the other thing is that the configuration of the robot again needs to be modified. So now we are sending in torques, and so we need to make it a robot receptive to force torques. All right, and so you'll see the unit change now on the input signal. And now let's hit run. So that didn't work very well. And so we're seeing the third robot, the plant model, is never coordinated in its motion with the essentially inverse kinematics or inverse dynamics robot. 
Okay, and so for the purpose of insight, I do want to introduce a little bit of discussion about the difficulty of the configuration of the robot, and I mean difficulty to control motion. All right, and I want to point to the axis right there, the axis right there, and then the axis right here. So essentially we have, it's like we have three pendulums stacked up on top of each other. And what makes it even more difficult is that their three, I'll call this triple pendulum, is inverted with respect to the direction of gravity. And that's a very unstable uh, mechanical configuration. Right? And so to make the problem a little bit easier, I'm going to go into our gravity definition. Right? And we see it right there. 0, 0, 0, and then minus 9.80665 in the z direction. And just multiply the whole thing by 0. And let's hit the run button. So now we're going to see things are doing a little bit better. You know, is that third robot's moving pretty well with the other robots until this happens. Okay, and as soon as it departs, we see that it diverges severely. Okay, and so now I'm going to take you through a little bit of organization to, to make an important point. All right, and so I'm going to take all this and create a subsystem. All right. And I'm going to just call that my motion trajectory plan. You know, that's what my inverse kinematics is doing for me. Okay. Now I take all this. Actually, let's do this too. So let's delete that. And let's give this guy its own version. It's not a big deal, but it'll make us set us up a little bit better. All right. So now let's take all this. Okay, right mouse click, create subsystem. All right, so this is basically a block or you know an operation that takes our our trajectory plan and tells the actuators what they need to do, you know, with regard to torque, which ultimately will enable us to control voltages to deliver the torques that we want. All right, and we saw a pretty good discussion in video number three where we considered electrical actuation on that topic. All right, so, oops, I don't want to call that trajectory plan. Let's call that controller. All right, and it made a little bit bigger box because controls are pretty important. All right, and then finally, let's take this. All right, and right mouse click, create subsystem. All right, let's make this even bigger because that's the robot itself. Okay, so we observe that there's some output ports on this subsystem. So when you create a um, subsystem inside Simulink, and it sees a block like this with some signals coming out that are not really going anywhere, Simulink automatically assumes that you're going to use that elsewhere, and it automatically places these little output port blocks, right? Okay, and that's why they, they show it the the this the assembly or I'll call it the system level, right? Well, the thing is we're not using that, and so I'm going to delete them, all right? In a way, that's our problem, okay? Because what it means is there's no feedback. You know, we're not taking those measurements and we're not using those measurements, okay? And what we need is to continually observe the state of the real robot and to inform our controller with that. Okay, so to wrap up this discussion, uh, we will revisit the model that we um, employed in our first video that kicked off this whole series. You know, that was a video that focused on uh, accuracy, speed, and power consumption trade-offs. Right, and so at that level, the you know that first model, we'll see that we are employing a feedback loop. And in a few moments, we'll get into the controller and show the adjustments that were made to the controller to accommodate that feedback and to employ it you know, to full potential. But let's look at kind of the results. You know, and you'll see, you know, right off the bat, very, very good performance. So let's kind of watch it go through this. You know, and this is, you know, a robot that is subject to, you know, the full gravitational forces too, right? So this is the challenging problem of controlling what I call the uh, triple inverted pendulum. Right. And um, in that first video, we do, you know, diagnose it pretty thoroughly. So um, if you want to really kind of 
get a, a reference on how well we did, you can certainly go watch that video again. But what I'd like to get into is, you know, how we did accommodate the, the feedback. And so let's get back into this. And so this is what our controller looks like now. So we have, you know, a motion command coming in. We have feedback coming in. And uh, we have torque going out. And that torque, you might recall, goes to our plant, which includes the mechanics and the electronics. And it's in the electronics and the actuation that we take torque and convert it into voltage. And our third video on electrical actuation goes into pretty good detail on that. All right. But let's look at our controller. Okay, here's our robot model, just like we've been doing it throughout this video. But the additional piece that we did was we added these blocks for each of our axes. All right. And um, I'll go into this block here and you'll see that, you know, that that torque coming in is what I call FF signal, which stands for feed forward, delivers kind of that ideally calculated torque. And what we add to it is an additional component. And ultimately this component is what I call error rejection. All right. And so it takes my commanded angle and it takes my feedback angle, subtracts off feedback to calculate error directly, and then we operate it on what I call an error rejection method, but you know that's what PID controllers are, and they do that exceptionally well. And MathWorks has you know excellent tools for tuning these things so you have ideal parameterizations for them. So I think it's pretty interesting, you know, that that mechanical model you know, whose origin is really the mechanical design captured in the CAD tool is used as much as it is to develop the software for uh, the controls of this robot, right? And, um, you know, it's used in analysis that it provides the plant model so that we can test the software, but it's also used in design, that it actually is part of the design of the software in that it provides the inverse kin kinematics as well as the inverse dynamics used in the controller. Right, and one of the things I think is kind of interesting about this is that that plant model, which again is precisely specified by the mechanical design captured in the CAD tool, it almost seems like it's cheating. This sh we should create a controller based on that perfect information to operate on the perfect implementation of that robot. And what I think is really interesting is that it still didn't work, at least with an open loop system. Right, and that feedback's essential. Right, and um, I think that what we've done from a feed forward point of view is extremely powerful, and I think it's responsible for the accuracy and performance that we're capable of hitting with robots now. But you're going to always need a little bit of feedback. You are always going to want an observation on your system, and you're going to want to use those measurements um, uh, as valuably as possible. All right, so, um, anyways. Uh, moving forward, say we're not done yet. You know that our goal is to ultimately get it onto an embedded processor. You know, here's my old processor. I did put the power electronics board onto the processor to just show how these things do work together. Okay, but with regard to you know getting this onto a processor, well, processors like this they don't run MATLAB, much less Simulink. Uh, or multi Simscape multi-body. And so how we use the code generation capabilities of Simulink to, to generate code that can be part of the development process for embedded software, we'll see a couple of videos coming up that will address that. So we continue to uh, encourage you to try it out that uh, all the files that we're using in these videos we're uh, putting on uh, the MathWorks website on MATLAB Central File Exchange and there are many ways for you to contact the MathWorks to acquire the software for evaluation. As always, uh, thank you very much for watching the video. Uh, if you liked it, please give us the thumbs up. Uh, we greatly appreciate that. Uh, again, we encourage you to contact us and we'd love to hear from you. This is Terry. Thank you. Bye.